All right, folks, welcome to the first ever episode of the Untitled Luke and Zach is po- Luke. <laughs> Beautiful start. I'm glad you know your own name. All right, we'll just cut this part out if we have to. Uh, do, you want to rest- say do you want to restart or do you want to just cut it out? Just cut it out. Or just keep okay. it. And people know what to expect from the shit show. <laughs> Go. All right. Welcome to the first ever episode of the Untitled Lucas and Zach podcast. I'm your host, Lucas, and with me is Zach. Um, how are you doing, hey. Zach? I'm good. Uh, my name is Zach. As you said, I'm six foot two, and I um, host a podcast with my ho- co-host, um, Lucas Schobach. That is correct. Um, so as we're, our plan is we're always going to start the first, start the episode with a little bit of discussion of the last film we logged on Letterboxd. Letterboxd, you know, is a, we're both a big fan of this. So Zach, what is the last thing, last movie you logged on Letterboxd? Um, last movie I logged in Letterbox. I looked up 30 seconds ago and already forgot. And I watched <laughs> it today. It is, uh, I want to hold your hand. Um, of course it is, is Robert Zemeckis's first film, um, about people trying to get into the Ed Sullivan show to see the Beatles. Um, it is an exhausting experience. <laughs> it is basically, you imagine the fans outside of Ed Sullivan screaming for the Beatles uh, made into a movie for 90 minutes. <laughs> All right. Well, I have not seen this movie, so I don't really have any comment on this. My f- last movie I logged was, I've been doing a little bit of an X-Men rewatch, and so my last movie I logged was X-Men Origins Wolverine, which is, as we all know, a great film <laughs> with um, truly amazing CGI. Like, it clearly would have should have won several Oscars for the CGI. Um, yeah, no. I like the first 40 minutes, and then it just... I've never seen a movie uh, self implode as impressively as that movie. It's kind of it's kind of impressive. Yeah, um, I saw X Men Origins Wolverine in the Garrettsville, Ohio cinema, and currently there's a lot of crazy racism happening in Garrettsville, and so that's nice. now how I think of X Men Origins Wolverine. <laughs> Supports racist cities. Yikes! Um, all right, so <laughs> you're not here for us to talk about X Men Origins Wolverine. You're here to talk for us to talk about big which is, of course, the 1988 Tom Hanks film. Wait, why are we watching Big, says everybody that's tuning in. I know, okay, this is a good podcast. (laughs) Well, let's explain. So our plan is to cover um, film looking at a month's worth of some kind of topic. And the first topic we're going to cover is the career of Tom Hanks, because who doesn't love Tom Hanks? And also, Zach has been watching all of Tom Hanks recently, and he forced me to watch some of them. So, um, you know, it's a good time to talk about Tom Hanks. Yeah, let's do it. So, uh, first up, big Zach, for the audience who doesn't know this, is terrible at plot summaries. So we are now going to make Zach explain the plot of the film Big. Okay. Now, the good news is everyone who's here listening to this episode should already understand what the episode Big, what Big is about. You should understand this movie. But let's see how uh, well Zach can do it. Zach, yeah, go, go read IMDb. Um, it is important to know before I start that I literally watched this yesterday. And this is <laughs> going to be how, how strong my memory is. So there's a kid uh, played by somebody. His mom is Mercedes Rule. That is her character name. Um, right. And and he um, you know wants to get with a girl because he's like 12. And that's what 12-year-olds do. He starts to feel feelings on the inside. Uh, 13, sure. Okay. And uh, he goes to a, a carnival. And they won't let him on a roller coaster because he's short. Okay, great dramatic um, tension <laughs> built right there. Um, so he he decides in his loneliness to walk off on his own and finds a, a Zotar machine, like we all do, is like put our woes to a, a robot fortune teller. Um, Absolutely. Which I get worried because they proceed to call it a game and it's not a game, but they they cover that. Um, and it, it it gives him or no, he wishes um, that he is big. Um, because he wants to get with that girl, and if he gets big, I wonder what he means by big. Okay, if he gets big, <laughs> um, he he will get all the girls he wants. He wakes up yep. the next day uh, in a giant hoodie that looks extra big. That's how we know he grew. And uh, he um, his mom freaks out, and he runs away, and they act like the kid was kidnapped. Yeah. And then he goes... Because he like played a computer game in his once in his life, he, he could be a great computer data entry person. 
<laughs> and, and, and like as good as anybody else that can get that job. And he works at uh, McMillan Toys. Look at that job, McMillan Toys. Um, it's like I studied for trivia. Uh, <laughs> and um, he uh, uh, is big <laughs> at this point. <laughs> His full Tom Hanks form, uh, and he he gets a, a house by himself. Oh, because he gets promoted to be a toy um, like taste maker. Like he just gets to say what toys are good and bad. That's his whole job. It's like the dream. Um, he does nothing but play. Um, because he plays piano. Um, with um, what Robert Loja, and they're like, okay, hey, we we have a bot, and that makes him get promoted. That's how I actually got my job. They made me play heart and soul on the piano. Um, do that. And when he has a promotion, he wins the heart of uh, Elizabeth Perkins um, because she's like too busy with the workplace, but she learns to have fun. And they have sexy night in their apartment because she's like, I, I never had a guy that likes trampolines before. Um, so that makes them have sex, um, but not in the bunk beds, but that would have been better. Uh, and uh, then she finds out he's a kid and they go back and turn him not into a or turn him into a kid no longer an adult by going back to um possibly the same Zoltar machine i don't know all of a sudden he's back to being a kid and appreciates it all the more and we all learn to childhood we should not take advantage of it take it for granted that's all right nice um that's good that's right david mosco plays that's the young kid um it's called super loops is the uh, ride he can't get on and he becomes the vice president of like product development you know because um, that corporation was clearly going under at some point because that's terrible management choices. That's a fancy word for toy tastemaker. <laughs> he decides what's good and not well, good. I think everyone in the audience just loved Zach's um, description. Um, it was very interesting. I'll give him a lot of credit for that. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, some things that we think are really interesting and worthy of discussion and big. Just stuff we noticed when we were watching it. So Zach, what is the first thing you would like to discuss in big? I think, yeah, the standout for this, um, especially with Tom Hanks getting his first Oscar nominee is why was this an Oscar nominee performance? And I think the physical acting that he is able to accomplish uh, throughout this film is amazing. I wrote lots of notes down. Where are these notes? Who knows? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but just the way his face moves at time, um, especially when Elizabeth Perkins is like trying to be very obvious to hit on him. And he just has this like earnest face that like truly is just trying to be in a, like hearing her, but has no idea what she's talking about and just trying to be like polite with her face and doesn't realize they're about to have sexy time. Um, but he also just looks like so awkward in his body and, and the way he kind of like jumps around at time and you watch him play the piano. There's just like an extra movement that kids have in the way they move that we no longer have the energy for that he's able to, you know, um, still exert. Uh, I, I find it pretty stunning. Um, is there any specific motions that Tom Hanks that stick out for you? I mean, I think it's really comes down to is he does that thing where he does the puberty kind of move where you just your body has jumped six inches, but your brain is still functioning yeah. in a much smaller body. He does this really good job of always walking like he doesn't understand his size. Like he always looks like he always the way he walks, his shoulders are kind of slumped. He looks like he's trying to be shorter. Like he doesn't understand how to be tall. Like he's now taller than a bunch of people, but like he still feels like that kid. And he's just it's the brilliance of like he really has the kid mind. He has the adult body, but he has the kid's mind. And that's you were talking about with Elizabeth Perkins. Yeah. All those scenes where she's hitting on him, he doesn't get it. She's like he's like she's like, oh I don't know if I should he's sleep over. And he's like Oh, you mean like sleepover? He thinks he's just talking about like, oh, your friend sleeps over and you like jump on a trampoline and play games. He has no idea she's actually trying to hit on him. Even like when she's in the car with him driving to his place and she's trying to tell him all this emotional stuff and he's being kind of a dick because he's a 12 year old and he's like, this is way cooler to be in a limousine. Oh, I can stick my head out the top. Oh, I can pick up the phone. Like he thinks oh, I can play with the radio. He's just like a little kid. And like, that's kind of, it makes sense if he goes into toys because his entire attitude towards the world is just, I want to play with everything. I want to go on the trampoline. I want to play with the yeah. genie machine. I want to play with everything. Even like his new body, he wants to play with that. He just wants to mess around and kind of touch and play with everything. Even so when he's biking the carnival to see if the Zotar is still there and like normal us, we'll like get off our bikes and look around. He's just kind of like looping around in like these odd little half circles. I mean, it was um, fall, you know, it was like, kid just keeps riding. <laughs> 
he almost like falls off his bicycle as a way of getting off. Like he's so awkward at it. And it's just like, my, it's really good. In the best, my favorite bit in the movie is when he's in the meeting about the, the um, robot buildings that we'll talk about later. Um, and he just like, he does his hands hold up in the middle of the meeting. And it's like so awkward because he kind of like tilts his head. Like, am I supposed to do this? And just being so patient because he's a schoolboy and this is how he yeah. was taught to do. And in the way, and his eyes are so wide waiting for the you know teacher's permission so he can say, hey, this boat robots are shit. Yeah, he also does the thing where they're having the dinner party and they're talking about like the PBS show in Columbus. And he does that thing where like that a lot of kids do where they just quote a fact. They don't understand the greater context of the fact or like they're not able to like the guy's trying to have a discussion about like the PBS show mm -hmm. and like what happened and everything. And he's just like, yeah, here's some facts I learned in history class when I was 11 or something. He's just like throwing that stuff out there. It's just like it really he's so good at playing. I'm a full grown man, but the mind inside me is still like a 12, 13 year old. Like it's, it's, it's unreal. It's like, I want to point out that you say kids do this, that they should say random facts, but I'm definitely sure this is how you like run any day. You just say, Hey, by the way, Christopher Columbus, uh, he did this. <laughs> I try not to try not to go with the Christopher Columbus. Anymore, that, that, that tends to play really bad these days, but, um, yeah, Christopher Columbus is not the most popular uh, person in the current context. All right, Zach, um, unless you have anything else in the physical acting, uh, why don't you talk about your next point? Yeah, my next one. And once again, I will never know character names. So we're going to call the characters of Tom Hanks and the characters of Robert Loja. His name's Robert, right? I'm not making this yeah. up. <laughs> no, uh, and, uh, you quoted the name of his company, so you should know his name too. <laughs> <laughs> um, my last words before I die is Macmillan Toys. Um, <laughs> So the, the relationship between Loja and Hanks um, is super endearing and charming and um, I think unexpected because usually when you have like the CEO of a corporation, they're going to be like this hard ass and like it needs to run like this. But like from the first time he meets him, he's just like so sweet to Hanks. There's like he is a child and most people would be concerned is like, why is this, um, you know, grown man acting like a little kid? But there's just such a connection and you really feel how he's kind of loosened him up and he he had Larva Loja gives a speech about the duck toy hand bed and and seeing that this energy and youthfulness in Tom Hanks um really helps him reconnect to why he got into that um and I don't know I, I really like these kind of mentorship relationships that you can feel are so sincere and um so impactful probably on both people involved um and Robert, Robert Loja just is able to exert such warmth within that character it is really surprising because like the first interaction they have is basically um, Josh Baskin running into them in the hallway because he's like a little kid trying to rush to get his work done because he has Who's that like Josh youth. Baskin? Do you mean Tom Hanks? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sorry for using character names. Tom, <laughs> Hanks, Tom Hanks runs into people uh, in the hallway. And um, yeah, he's just, he's really endearing. And I think that like a lot of times when movies are known in popular culture by one scene, that scene sometimes doesn't always hold up when you watch it, but the piano sequence is delightful. It's a wonderful sequence, just like the joy of these two seeming adults playing like piano songs that to the audience, like we know that Tom Hanks is actually a kid, but he looks like an adult. So it looks like these two adults playing a song that they play, that they learned when they were like school children taking yeah. piano lessons after school. And it's like just a wonderful moment between the two of them. And even how like Loja tries to pull him away from it. He wants to go keep looking at other stuff because he's just like obsessed with, I have to see everything to see what, you know, what's being sold. And Hank kind of pulls that like youthfulness out of him. And it's like, Hey, it's okay to take three minutes and, you know, do a fun piano solo on this walking piano. Cause it's fun to play with. You don't just have to see every product is something you're selling. You can also just enjoy it. Like you can have that enjoyment in life. Yeah, the scene works because it doesn't come out from nowhere. Like he has already earned his respect by the time they got to the scene. That was just like the cementing of their bond. Because but before that, he's already said like, "Yeah, that hockey toy. You know, it'd be better if um uh, something different about it the could all move. All the pieces could move. Yeah, yeah. The all the pieces of all the pieces can move. And so he's like giving good advice while still had like showing his perspective that can connect with the kids. At that point, Robert Lowe's just like. I'm vibing. I'm vibing with this guy. So when yeah. they get to the piano, he's already in the mood to like loosen up and have fun. It's not like they go from, you know, him being a 
angry, doubtful, CEO, skeptical of who this guy is to like, let's jump on the piano and all of a sudden it's magically warmth. They really gradually build that relationship within that scene. Mosher has like a real father figure relationship with him almost because like there's all these sequences in the board meetings where like Hanks is the one being like, this doesn't make any sense and this, this isn't cool. And like, it would be so easy for the CEO to be like, oh my God, this lower level moron is like blowing up our meeting where all of our market tested toys have been like proven that they're good, but he's the one who's going to bring up there's a problem. But he like really respects him, which is interesting because nothing Hank says about the toys is particularly like eloquent or brilliant. He's just like, yeah, nobody wants to play, nobody wants to play with a building. Like yeah, kind of I mean, in real life, there's no way they're taking this guy's opinion. Like we do tons of market research here, some random just like, I want my hockey toys to move. I know. They've done 2,500 hours of research, no. <laughs> and so he's like, I don't really think this building is that cool. But um, yeah, no, I love the relationship between the two of them. It really, I think, makes the movie. Hey, great transition. We're going to get better at this. Once you say that building doesn't really look cool, my next topic is um, the bug robots. Uh, <laughs> so, it, during the, their um, you know meeting discussing a new toy, it's the building that turns into a robot, a robot that turns into a building. It's very specific. It's like the robot turns into a building. Acting right. like it doesn't do both. If it turns into a building, it works the same way. The building will turn into a robot. It doesn't just stay a building forever. Of course. Yeah. Um, and and his brilliant idea that the one over everybody is like, uh, uh, what about bugs? I think bugs is a better idea. First of all, um, I have lots of thoughts about this. I mean, I think you have to you know, have to bring up the point, which is important to say. He didn't just say bugs. He made specific to reference prehistoric bugs, so like bugs. giant winged, you know, like old ones. They're like way creeper when like the earth had like different atmosphere and stuff and the bugs got a lot larger. Oh, he said that. And everyone else is like, I'm going to make a ladybug. <laughs> this genius <laughs> idea, a ladybug into a robot. Uh, and they trash his building idea. I think the building idea was cool. Okay, it doesn't need to move. The <laughs> robots fucking move. The ro the buildings get to hide, and they're like, "Hey, I'm a building." But then when everyone goes to bed, the like Eiffel Tower all sends a giant robot. Imagine an Eiffel Tower that turns into a robot. That's a great transformer. Most I mean, Michael like Bay is doing, Michael Bay's next movie is definitely including a transformer as the Eiffel Tower. So yeah. you just tell me now, what would you buy? Eiffel Tower that turns into a robot, or a ladybug that turns into a robot, <laughs> <laughs> and it's this big. I mean, to be fair, in defense of Hanks, he starts to play with the the tower, and like one of the arms falls off. So like, it clearly was not well designed. It has nothing to do with the idea, though. It was a prototype. They trash this idea, and they even give it a fair shot. But there's like bugs, and it's gold. <laughs> we got I mean, mammoth robots. We got uh, potato bug slash pill bug, whatever you decide to call it. Robots. Uh, Nobody wants that. Actually, I want a tail bug robot. I imagine like rolls. <laughs> I mean, I think part of the problem is that the guy suggesting the tower is just the worst. And like, no one yeah. wants to defend that guy. So the guy's like, here's my idea. And everyone's like, is there literally any idea? Does somebody want to sell people like rocks? Can we sell rocks to people? Like they will take any idea for anything that guy suggests. But they, okay, first of all, I think it unfairly gave me empathy towards something because I'm like, this guy, like, he lost his great robot, his building robot idea. But also, uh, I lost every thought I was going to have about this. Uh, <laughs> I don't care. Bug idea was dumb. Building right. idea was Zach dumb. is not on board with the bugs. He wanted the tower, unless it's a potato bug, which is a very weird specific reference. All right, Zach. Next thing you want to talk about. Hit it. Oh, yeah. I have a list. Uh, his apartment. Oh, uh, we have to. Yeah. His apartment, one, kick ass. But don't you think, like, nowadays, this is just, like, a normal 28-year-old's apartment? <laughs> like, this is, like, some, like, kid makes it in Silicon Valley. Every nerd from Silicon Valley has a pinball machine, has a Pepsi machine. There's definitely a trampoline somewhere if they can have it. Like, this has became, like, the modern you know, young guy, do you think Big started this? Do you think Big started the inability to grow up when you're 20? I think sure. there's a 100% chance that there are like YouTubers and TikTok influencers who have houses like this and you go into them and they've just got like random stuff they could never need. Do you think that they've been big? Have we been thinking that these YouTubers oh, wow. are adults, but they've been big like 15, this is a, you used to be 12 or 13. 
based on the accuracy of the plot. <laughs> uh, well, he's 12 and then he turns 13. It was a birthday. Logan middle. Paul is definitely a 12 year old that doesn't realize the racist shit they say is racist. Wow. And that's why you're doing this. This is a really good move for the first episode of our podcast is to take shots at people with much larger audience, audiences yeah. than ours. <laughs> Okay, but yes, the apartment is great. I, I, whoever decided who built that set, who de decorated it, is like a genius because it looks exactly like what would happen if you gave a 12-year-old 50K and was like, hey, go buy everything. He's got – I took like notes on everything. He has a bl giant blow-up Godzilla. Absolutely no reason to have that. He's got a pinball machine that you don't have to pay anymore. He has got a Pepsi vending machine that he throws baseballs at to give himself sodas. <laughs> He's got a trampoline, which is covered with various sizes of balls, so he can play whatever kind of ball game he wants at any moment. He's got a chair that has eyes. Sexy bunk beds. Sexy cars. He has sexy he has bunk, bunk beds. I do have a question, though. I think that you're supposed to have at least one side of the bunk beds against the wall, so you can't, like, roll out of them. That seems like a poor design. Yeah. Put him on the center of the room. He doesn't know. It's true. He's not. Yeah, he's 12. He's not the greatest. But um, I yeah. put every bed that I've owned until my recent one against the wall because I would probably fall out. <laughs> I don't know. I do agree. It is a wonderful apartment. It looks exactly like what would happen if you let a 12-year-old um, decorate his own apartment. Yeah. Um, while I was on the topic of bunk beds, we're going to go real off topic, but I got a bunk bed story that the world needs right. to know so they can understand how great I am. So uh, when I was in college, I had a bunk bed, uh, right. like a lot of people did, and I was the top bunk, and you know the remote was down on my desk for the TV, and it was like too much work to get down. So I decided <laughs> to uh, lean downwards to grab it off my desk. I am a tall Ooh. person, so I feel like that would work. And I grabbed it, but then my weight did, proportion the proportions went too far the other way, and I went uh -oh. straight down. My arms hit the desk, flipped me backwards, and I landed on my feet. And I've never done anything that great in my life. That's I drew a sick. picture for all my friends to see <laughs> to witness the story. And I still tell this on this podcast and every podcast I will have in the future because um, people need to know I'm an, I'm an athletic gentleman. All right. The weekly Zach and Buck <laughs> story segment is now over. And Zach, do you have any more comments about the apartment or can we move on to what I think is actually potentially the most interesting uh, thing you have to talk about with this film? Uh, yes. My last one is the runaway kidnapping plot that yeah. uh, so, um when he runs away they assume he's kidnapped you yep. see his face on a milk carton that's Mercedes right Roy is you know somewhat upset i would say probably like not upset enough you don't even see the dad um at all uh you never see cops and i think you see him once Yes, when he when his friend grabs stuff out of his house for him, you see the cops at their house. But that's literally the only sequence that there seems to be any oh, big deal. Yeah, and they like so Tom Hanks has to call home to the mom because he wants to speak to her. But then she's like, "You have my son," and he has to pretend that he's keeping um, young Josh Baskin. I know character names. I'm trying to keep him. Uh, that they're kidnapping him. They don't explain why they're kidnapping him. They're just like, hey, we're just chilling with your son. <laughs> He's good. He'll be back eventually. They never ask for money because, I mean, he doesn't need it. But there's like, there's just no reason for them to understand what has happening with this kidnapping. There's just like, someone took my son and they're hanging out with him. It's not taken seriously enough. No. You see more action taken. Um, I mean, you're trying to make a light like, comedy. I feel like you could have found a different route than like, my kid is kidnapped. <laughs> Yeah, I I was actually watching it this time. It's kind of cruel what cruel. the big Josh Baskin does to his family, like calling them and writing them letters, like pretending like but like at the same time he can't contact them because they don't believe him to be the their son. But he like keeps talking to them and I'm like, this feels <laughs> like kind of cruel that you're like you just keep calling them and sending them letters and like it's not really ever discuss like how kind of harsh that is to just like keep bringing it up to your family that you're lost and like yeah it is really bizarre that they never at any point are like hey why don't we have the cops over when he calls so like yeah. we can try to trace it or like why don't we try to figure out where this letter was postmarked from so we can figure out how to find like they never do anything like that he also like continues to use his real name like he doesn't change names when he goes to new york so it's kind it's of shocking to that figure out 
And if he's caught, keeps calling home, they're going to be tracking his phone call. But they're not right. tracking where he's from. Yeah. They like do they they basically I, I kind of wish that they had written a a note where he just like, oh I've run off to join the circus or I've run off to do just like something to make it a little bit less like a like a, a just like a sticking point because I feel like it, it really in moments of the film it really like shrouds over it and makes it like a little darker than I think you want the film to be. Which I don't think you want this film to be dark. And there's definitely moments where like he's calling and like singing the song she sang to him as a kid, and it's like it's kind of sad. It's like really kind of depressing because it's like, wow, she's like, you're like really like kind of emotionally tormenting her, but you can't actually show her your son. It's like maybe you should have just stayed away if you can't actually show them that you're her son that can I come see. back. Like, if, it might be better just to pretend he was dead, just like throw some corpse out, and then they can at least like get over it. But all right, like, well, Zach is not suggesting. <laughs> Zach is not suggesting the more dark. Uh, the darker, even darker version of this movie where uh, the character dies and then another person named Josh Baskin shows up in New York as a vice president of a toy company, which would, I feel like be even even weirder story. But yes, I agree. I agree that this is probably, um, I think probably the biggest, I think one of the two big sticking points in the movie, this is the one, we'll talk about the other one later. But yeah, this is one that just like, it makes it darker than I think they want the movie to be. We disagree on the other one too, so that's going to be fun. Oh, but, uh, wow, uh, okay. Uh, um, you know it's a too dark of a plot point when if you were to make like a Lion King one and a half spinoff that takes place in the same time with different characters and you're just from the mom's point of view, you're basically making prisoners. So you just spin <laughs> when the, when the spinoff movies, you got prisoners and big and they exist in the same world. Uh, you know you had a problem there. All right. And uh, great point. I want to talk about Josh's eating habits. So not just the fact that he buys a ton of junk food with his first paycheck that's like all he does and remember don't eat the pork rinds they make you sick um he has a really interesting habit of licking the filling out of any kind of food he's eating so there's a scene where he's sitting in his room at the hotel and he's eating oreos like a weirdo where he's just licking the filling out and throwing the cookies on the floor which I feel is like, this is pretty normal though i feel like there's a bunch of weirdos i don't do it but i feel like i feel like, like, I feel like you, <laughs> can, you could you, you should you can just eat the filling or you can like you know, get rid of one of the cookies and double stuff them yourself. But I feel like you don't just throw it on the floor. And then he goes to the like the gala, like the big party for his company. Yeah. And he's just like licking cream cheese out of his piece of celery and then just dropping the celery on the table. He just and again, it kind of goes back to it. He really is a 12 year old. He's just like yeah. he doesn't. He's a 12 year old eating Oreos and he just throws them on the floor because he's like, well, my mom's going to come clean them up. Isn't she like I'm a 12 year old. I don't like do this stuff or like he's just at the party and he has like terrible table manners and is being kind of rude and like no one would want to eat near you if you're like you know partially consuming food and then getting rid of it but you're he's a 12 year old beluga into uh, his hands um, oh yeah he really should not have tried that can i say this almost made me completely on josh baskin and wish he never got back to his youth and his life was ruined because he and not that this isn't realistic but um picky eaters are assholes and when he's not like able to appreciate this probably delicious beluga i didn't know you could eat beluga but like i don't want it uh and he's like ugh, ugh, puking it into his hands I'm like chill out you can at least swallow calm down you're being a dramatic asshole kid and um if Theo acts like that, my son Theo, when he is 12 years old, that kid is gone. <laughs> he is <laughs> off to an orphanage. I'm going to fake my own death. And then he gets to go to an orphanage. All right. Zach is getting rid of his kid. He doesn't need beluga. All right. Um, so actually, another thing I want to talk about is you mentioned this in your plot summary. He goes to the machine and he goes, I want to be big, which is one of the <laughs> least specific wishes I've ever heard of. Like, they, they they infer this to mean he wants to be an adult. And I think at some point they make a joke about him being 30. But, like, there are so many different... About his dick. <laughs> it's definitely about his penis. <laughs> that is a possibility. What if it actually made him big? What if it made him, like, he was freaking giant? What if he was, like, seven feet tall? What about that movie where, you know, big is about a seven-foot tall dude trying to work at a computer in a toy, in a toy company? Then you can have a crossover with that and like Mike, and they're both in the NBA. It'll be great. Uh, I, I, you have to think that literally what he meant is, can you please, can I just be like one inch bigger so I can ride this ride right. and get with he that girl? To be like, right, he wanted to be two years older so he could get on the super loops and go with the girl. 
like, you don't even have to be older. It's like stretch out my legs a bit, man. So tired. <laughs> and the guy was like, "Nope, you're now 30, and you have to go wear ill-fitting clothes and hang out in New York." This is one of my biggest nitpicks of the movie, too, is when you're 12, unless you're super short, you can get on any ride. There's no way this kid was too small for a carnival roller coaster that just goes upside down. All right, can we talk about another thing for a second? Those carnivals, if you ever been to a carnival, you ever been to one of those fairs, they have the little this sign that says, awesome. you have to be this high to ride. Um, yeah. No one follows those. I have been on rides where it's like, you have to be like four feet tall, and there's like, you look around, around you on the ride, and there's like some... Two foot eight kid on there. They just let on. <laughs> he's basically he gonna fun. fly. He's gonna basically fly off if they take it too fast to curve because he doesn't fit in the thing anymore. But no one cares about those safety rules. I have definitely been kicked off a ride or not allowed on a ride because I was too short. But that's when I was like wow. seven and too short for a ride. By the time I was eight, I was big enough for rides. Josh Baskin. Hey, no, what kind of ride is that? Have too, short, I'm growing. <laughs> too short to be on your twelve. That is a, like, that's that's an like you need to be five foot nine <laughs> to get onto this ride. Um, I definitely put like socks in my shoes. My dad made me to get onto certain rides at <laughs> Cedar Point. Um, like so this. wait, come on, Josh, don't ask for a wish. Put socks in your shoes. Oh, dude, school. just like lean forward, like do tippy toes, <laughs> and see if they'll just like stop paying that much attention. Just hit the guy in the crotch and run on the ride. I think I think the real moral of the story is that Josh really didn't care that much about going on this ride with a girl because he didn't really try that hard. Could have tried a lot harder. Come on, Josh. Step your game up. Yeah, I mean, he was already defeated because there was the, the tall guy. He also just wanted to be like that guy. Remember, right? that guy drives. That guy drives. He drives. He drives. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that is the only description of the character um, is that he drives. The only hate description him, of the character. This is how my wife introduces me ever. This is my husband, Zach. He drives. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A little bit more of a sombering topic. The sleepover car, the sleepover t um, time, and then the which they don't think they hiccup the first time. They definitely hook up the, after the second time. Sexy time. Sexy time. Although, I think this is kind of creepy, to be honest. I think if you start, no. I think if you watch the movie at face value, it's not creepy. But if you think about the fact, that this kid is a 12 year old who, just for the record, kind of a pervy 12 year old. Yeah, he's that's why looking... he's going to have sex if he can have sex. He doesn't know, I know. what it is. He knows he wants it. She doesn't know he's a kid, so it's not creepy. He's okay, there's two, there's two things I would point out. One, when, she tell, when he tells her that he's like 13, she does not react. She literally jokes about hold on to my number for a couple years and then like do this again. That's kind of creepy, right? No, you're just trying to make – you had a moment. You've already had sex, so it's it's been done. Like, you can't take that back. So the creepy oh, that's fair. Past. So, but yeah, I just trying to, like, have a kind thing. She had true feelings for him as an adult. Okay, they're sincere feelings, and they're fair to have because he's a 30-year-old man when she is with him. She did nothing wrong. Well, remember – oh, actually, that's – I would actually agree. With you. I don't think she did anything wrong. Remember when she calls and him a great moment. He's a I think, kid. I think it's – I think it's a little bit – um, you know, a little bit not great that he didn't tell her at all, and like almost told her, but then <laughs> didn't tell her. <laughs> so now you're putting this that, like he's telling him that uh, you know he has a wife is the same thing as hey, you know, I'm actually a real child trapped in a human's body. Like <laughs> this is something you have to tell all women before you get on dates: is are you or are you not actually a twelve year old? Like this is a normal thing to tell people. I'm not saying you have to everyone has to say this. I'm just saying that if you are maybe a 12 year old in the body of a 30 year old man and an adult woman is hitting on you, maybe you should like at some point bring that up so that she doesn't feel terrible when the news is actually revealed. He also already tried to tell his mom and no one believed him. And then he was like treated like a burglar. So that's telling right. people was not going to work. You make a fair oh, point. So make a fair point. At all right. He's not going to be right. like. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's played off very sweet. It's very sincere. And they never act like it's this true love romance. It's so more like she's been impacted by being with something someone so youthful, but like shit, like he's a kid. So this isn't gonna work. But he think... also never seems love. It seems like, you know, there's like a lady is like doing it. He doesn't know what it means, and they never act like he knows what it means or what love is. I mean, yes, are so bad of a girl. The 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 minute she asks tries to ask him what it means, he basically throws a, a magazine at her. So 
uh, start but, swatting her. Like, but, but, like how you show your fourth grade crush that you like her, spot her with a magazine. Basically, that was the 13 year old version of pulling the hair uh, that Josh decided <laughs> to do in that scene. Um, so, the final question I would ask you about this film is Do you think this movie could have more to say if it um, maybe focused a little more on like, what he lost because i feel like this movie almost reads like a a spin on it's a wonderful life and the idea yeah. that like oh you really you're so desperate to be big that you jump forward in the situation and it feels like the movie he he enjoys being an adult so much more than he seems to enjoy being a kid that it almost doesn't make sense that he goes back at the end <laughs> Yes, I agree. I think there is some, you know, thematic subtext of, you know, not taking for granted your child. Like they try to do it. Like yeah. appreciate your childhood. But it's all within like a three minute montage of him seeing, you know, his sad mom and his old friends. In the um, school they don't class really, getting a picture. Yeah. yeah. They don't really build it up enough to like why is it important to be, you know, a child and go through those experiences. Um, so you can, you know, become a more responsible adult than he was. Why the childhood experience is valuable to our lives. They could have right. hit that a little more. But it's not the focus. It, I want to be a comedy. No, and it's, it's, it's just an interesting question that I thought about the end of it. It was like, he has so much fun as an adult. Like, yeah. they almost ne he, like, he almost never has a bad experience as an adult. Like, the worst thing that happens to him as an adult is he has to, like, play a jerk at, like, squash. I think it's what it's called. Yeah, and, uh, and um, the guy, it's a great scene because he, <laughs> that's another scene where he's like a child because he's like, you broke the rules, like you have to follow the rules. He has that like that like child purity of like, yeah, you have to follow the rules. If like the rules matter, you can't just like if the line's there for a reason. You know, like adults might be willing yeah. to bend it because like, oh, I don't want to fight about this or like it might be advantageous. You know, it might help me out. But he's just like, well, you have to follow the rules. Another great scene. But I just yeah, wanted to think about the. I stick with that scene, but also like everyone he comes in contact, he kind of brings the child out of them. He does with, you know, Elizabeth Perkins' character, he does with Robert Loja. He does it out of this asshole too, but like the worst possible way, like the <laughs> worst version of a child. So he's just like a bully and starts fighting him. He's like, no, I'm not cheating. Hit the ball again. And it's like this bratty competitive kid. Um, so I just like the comparison between those two, you know, versions of adult childhood. It's a good point. You just really kind of bring the child out and everyone. Um, Zach, do you have anything else to say about Big? Um, yes, uh, and this is in my letterbox review. Follow at me, uh, whatever my name is. I don't know, Zach Ford. Uh, Put in the comments. Yeah, uh, I think that I want to, I should have went through the Big experiment. I think this should be a real thing. Ooh. Like, we should turn all 13-year-olds um, Big. Because as you, this connects to your idea, because I think there is, you know, a, a lesson learning experience to have. I think it, I'm doing most of that work to to in my own head on how you can learn from this. The movie does not tell you that much on how you can learn from being big. But if every shithole 13 year old can experience what it's like to be an adult, it'll be like your your uh, pubescent rumspringa. Um, you get to go and live the life as a dog. You can choose if you want to go back and, you know, experience childhood and teenagehood um, in the right way. Or if you're like, you know what, I got I got it good. Uh, and I think it will create more thoughtful, responsible humans. So my proposition is we make um, big machines happen. I actually think this is not a bad idea because there's a lot yeah. of people. I think you spend a lot of teenagehood obsessed with wanting to be the next age. And then at some point you realize, oh, wow, like life is different as you age, but it's not like it suddenly becomes 10,000 times amazing. Like I feel it would be interesting to send, to do like a more realistic version of big where you send kids to 30 and you're like, hi, you're 30. Here's a really boring job. You don't like that. You have to work all the time. Like you're like the plant manager at a factory and it's just boring and generic. And you have to look at yeah. spreadsheets all day. Like rather than like the, the big experience where it's like, Oh, he's, he basically gets to do a kid's job. Um, like really be interesting to see like, oh, wow, you just have to do something boring and generic for, you know, five days a week. Let's get rid of eighth grade, get them an internship and make them live inside prostitute hotels. <laughs> hey, man, it's a religious hotel. <laughs> uh, yes, it's St. James. <laughs> All right. So we are talking we talked about big as our main film today because we wanted to talk about the 1980s run of Tom Hanks, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit for a second about, I'm going to give you a quick rundown, everyone in the audience, about 
what movies Tom Hanks did in the 1980s. So Tom Hanks starts the 1980s with He Knows You're Alone, which is a really generic horror film. And kind of seems like it just wants to be Halloween. Uh, Hanks is barely in the film. He goes to Splash, where he falls in love with a mermaid. He goes to Bachelor Party, where his Bachelor Party almost ruins his wedding. This movie ages really poorly. Um, please stop making jokes about, oh, I thought I slept with a woman, and now it's actually a dude. Not funny. Wasn't funny then. Wasn't funny now. Um, the Man with One Red Shoe, where the CIA thinks Tom Hanks is a bad guy because he has mismatched shoes. This movie is nonsense. Uh, volunteers, he joins the Peace Corps to build bridges. Uh, the Money Pit, which is a remake of Cary Grant's Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House, which is a better movie than The Money Pit. Um, Nothing in Common, which is a father and son movie, Jackie Gleason's final film. Every time you say goodbye, this movie is, it feels like it should be a foreign film, not something with Tom Hanks. He plays an American who joins the British Air Force and then falls in love with this Jewish girl in Israel who is like a, from a sect of the Jewish people who are like from Spain. Truly bizarre movie. Dragnet, which is the buddy cop film based on the radio and television crime drama of the same name. Big comes next. Then we have Punchline, which is Great. sort of a stand-up comedy movie. <laughs> and then sort of like a Tom Hanks needs to get some emotional maturity. Sally Field is wonderful. Uh, then we get The Burbs, where Tom Hanks thinks the neighbors are murderers. Uh, it was really weird at the time because I was watching at the same time I was watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And it basically feels like Tom Hanks thinks his neighbors are the characters from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And then Turner and Hooch, which is a buddy cop movie with a dog, which I actually liked a lot, and I know a lot of people don't, but um, I'm a fan of Turner and Hooch. I like it would have been better if Hooch was a cat. Imagine a cat trying no. to solve a crime. <laughs> Some no, good action there. How is a cat going to attack people like Hooch does? And Tom Hanks is looking at a cat saying, hey, you big old cat, stop drooling. This cat has rabies in my story. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a dark turn. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some major themes of Tom Hanks in the 1980s. I would argue that his major theme is um, these movies, if you wrote up a quick plot to pitch to a studio, the studio would should pass on all of these movies because they sound ridiculous. Yeah, they're very high. I mean, that's the 80s. The 80s was ridiculous. They're all like very high concept. They were really uh, possibly because of Bosom Buddies, which came in between Splash and... Um, he knows you're alone. Um, doesn't know you're alone. He may or may not know you're alone. He, know, he, one know, of he knows you're alone. Franchise. Uh, <laughs> it's a generic movie with a generic title. And um, so in between that, he got sitcom famous for Bosom Buddies. And it was like, this is our comedy star. And he's putting these like broad ass movies like Bachelor Party. And um, which kind of came back to style of movies in the early 2000s. It was basically... Um, what like the old school and those um, kind of frat boy movies were in the early 2000s, um, which is, this is the shittiest version of it. Um, Bachelor Party Tom is, Hanks literally just, is, is literally just the 03 to 09 run of comedies, which is like old school to The Hangover. That's basically what it was. Is it was kind I think of Tom Hanks, movie. yeah. Yeah, I think Tom Hanks is mostly good doing these comedy roles, but they're such, as you said, ridiculous premises. Um, but anyone who was like, how did Tom Hanks become like this SNL icon as a host? Like that was what he was doing for a decade. It was like yeah. full length SNL characters, like volunteers. He's just like this rich guy that has to go work in Peace Corps. It is straight up an SNL character. Also volunteers. Oh yeah. <laughs> also it really, it they really do read like skits because it very, like a lot of these movies, it's really clear that they had a, basic premise for the movie and like a couple of joke sequences, but they really run out of plot fast. And they're like, e like volunteers is a good example of this. They really don't have enough plot for a whole movie. The entire joke is like, Oh, he's like this rich kid who hasn't done anything. And he has to hide on the plane. Like, it, like they don't have enough plot for a whole movie. So like, that's yeah. one, I think that's one of the big, really big problems. And you see this in a lot of his movies. It's just like, man, he's really good in a lot of these movies and he's very funny and he's very charming. He's very engaging, but these movies are not good enough outside of a couple of them are not good enough to be Tom Hanks movies. No. And I wonder if he had, I mean, like splash was a big hit and I, and I like splash and Blig was huge, but if one of these really broad ones, like if bachelor party, like critically and financially was just like a huge success, if that might've changed his career, if he really would have been stuck in the comedy, you know, icon part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do have to wonder if like, if he just, if the comedies had just been his thing because not to foreshadow too much, the 90s is not very similar to this decade at all in terms of what he does. Um, 
And I think he does a little bit more of like his, I think big and the burbs and stuff like that really kind of influences his future movies choices a lot more than the volunteers man with one red shoe, you know, yeah, I think the real turn of when he wanted to have dramatic touch was probably nothing in common, although that movie just doesn't work. But to me, the successful one, which no one else will agree with, that really highlights what how he's going to be able to melt that um, comedy experience and that comedy perspective into more dramatic takes as punchline. Um, he's playing basically a human that tries to act like these old Tom Hanks characters with broad humor, but that humor is all used to cover this like deep, deep sorrow and like hate of himself. Um, yeah. So so combining these, you know, broad gags, but every time he does these broad gags, you see so much sadness as he's doing it. Um, it's a great singing in the rain scene that everyone should watch um, where he's doing, you know, singing in the rain dance routine while he's just like absolutely miserable the whole time. Yeah, I it's, I actually agree. I think uh, probably punchline big the verbs. That's the run that really kind of tells you about it. Turner and Hooch is kind of a weird um, thing that doesn't make a lot of sense at the end of the decade because it feels a lot more like his early decade work than like what he would do going forward. But yeah, no, I think he was the decade goes. It is actually kind of amazing that Tom Hanks became as famous as he did because a lot of these movies are like not good or like kind of mediocre. And then, and like, like I think I was looking at this earlier. I think only three of them maybe are even fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Like yeah, three of them. I, I think a few of them were still like big financial hits. Like I think Bachelor Party yeah. made money. You can double check with me on this, but I think it made money. Like Splash definitely, made, definitely was a big hit. Splash was huge. Well, Splash and Big are definitely big hits. Yeah. Yeah. So he had his hits, but it wasn't as consistent. And then between Splash and Big was four years. Yeah, and like a lot of those movies in the meantime are just like why would anyone care about this movie like you know like you know I, yeah. the only reason you're ever going to watch volunteers or man with one red shoe or dragnet or a lot of these movies is like oh i am specifically going out of my way to watch tom hanks movies that he's in because they have almost no like footprint on society. Like no one ever talks about man, the man with one red shoe. That's like, you know, that movie is basically um, like non-existent. Um, yeah. I guess every, Bachelor time Party's kinda hit. every time we say goodbye, it's the most non-existent movie that any like mainstream actor has ever done. So I, fun fact. I no one knows what that movie is. It came out in 1986. It did not receive a DVD release until 2006. 20 years later, it took until the 20th anniversary oh. for them ever to release it on DVD. It would have been real weird if they released it on DVD in 1986. That would have been a lot True. better story if they released the DVD 14 years before they were DVDs. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting point. That's a good point. Um, so I guess Bachelor Party made $38 million on a $6 million budget. So that's kind of a big hit. But yeah. No, I don't think... Yeah. I think the interesting thing about that is even that there's a lot of people who will you know drum for different 2000s comedies that are kind of raunchy and crazy i don't think there are many people who are like man bachelor party is really good and no one else in that movie has ever mattered that's another thing to point out most of his co-stars in any of these movies have never amounted to anything close to what tom hanks was able to come by yeah i mean it's it's really a lot of a lot of people who have really small roles and maybe sally field might be the biggest co-star it's a lot of people who are at the she end of their run star at that time though she was already it's a lot of people star. yeah it's true there's a lot of people who are at, like the end of their runs you know like the jackie gleason's and stuff who were kind of at the end of their run yeah you're right there is literally no one in that movie yeah he has a lot of a lot yeah. of like nobody co-stars uh so um, we've talked about do you have anything however, else to say about after the party yeah. they gave it we're both talking okay. at the same time. This makes great podcasting. <laughs> you can cut the audio and do, release it a separate podcast, and you can unite right. it together to make one. Um, Bachelor Party did give us um, Tom Hanks driving a Catholic school bus. That as soon as they're away from the nuns, these kids just like lose their shit and jumping everywhere. And um, that's how all school buses are, and that's a great gag. But um, school buses suck, and the world needs to know this. <laughs> I will also applaud any movie that makes fun of tennis by attempting to turn it into a baseball game 
that is uh, potentially my favorite joke in the entire movie, which is saying something because that movie is, for a movie who's trying really hard to be funny, is not that funny. It's real funny for 10 minutes and then it's nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's also like, it even ends up being just boring, which is like, how do you make that movie boring? Like, I feel like that's the one thing you should not do. Um, Zach, any other final thoughts on the 1980s and Tom Hanks's career for that uh, time period? Oh, I just think it's fascinating how inconsistent his career is there to lead to one of the most consistent runs an actor has ever had. Pretty as soon as the 90s, or not soon, like a couple years in the 90s, and he has one of the best runs ever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I do not think if you, I don't think a person sitting there late 1989 after watching all these Tom Hanks movies, I'm like, this guy is going to become one of the biggest stars and most well-respected actors, and this guy's definitely going to get a bunch of awards. I don't think anyone would have done that looking at that run. And we're going to talk about the perfect movie to, to define his um, great 1990s runs, Bonfire of the Vanities, next week. Tune in. Um, so that's I just have true. to... So please tune in to the actual show. That's <laughs> <laughs> next week, we are going to do Apollo 13 and talk about the 1990s in Tom Hanks' career. This is a... Uh, a really different decade. Not going to go any farther into that because we'll talk about it next week. But um, yeah, very different decade. Um, Zach, any other final thoughts? Um, I like Tom Hanks. I'm excited to talk about him. Um, I think his career is more, a lot of people might think it's pretty samey, but I think it's more interesting. And each decade can be pretty defined by a certain kind of role and that's our goal um also i love you and i love you audience and thank you for listening to my beautiful voice well thank you zach um so that's this week for us folks uh come back next week for apollo 13 we would like to thank michael campbell paulo yama nazario montenegro and mike hanley for producing our show and being uh wonderful studios you know just a wonderful studio to work for yeah we work for a studio uh, yeah. Producers and executive producers, they put a lot of money um, on the line for this. This is a really expensive uh, podcasting project, so we thank you for listening. Uh, you know, uh, we will get back to you in terms of uh, more stuff with social media and like where you can find the podcast for now. I'm going to start with YouTube, see how you guys like it. Um, yeah, throw a comment down below, give us a like, and uh, yeah, just enjoy the podcast. We will see you next week. Blowing a kiss, blowing a kiss. Thank you, Zach. See you next <laughs> week, folks. <laughs>